I'm very pleased to announce that we have a very special guest tonight on tonight's Slate Show, and don't miss this opportunity to talk to somebody who's been in ministry probably longer than you've been living. Uh, John Mackay, thank you very much for joining us, John. Good day, Howard. How are you, mate? It's good yeah. to see you again. It is, isn't it? Now, you've just flown in from some local airport. Uh, well, yes, you could say Australia, if you think of that as the old empire being local, that's n no doubt about it. And we got delayed 13 hours in one airport, so, uh, yes, but it's good yeah. to be here. Yeah. Good to uh, be here for the Late Show. Well, do you know, John, we go back many years as well, probably since before the beginning of uh, Revelation TV That's being correct. a TV channel. So We're both dinosaurs now. We are now. And it, I get called that playing football sometimes, you dinosaur. But anyway, the thing is that they are in evidence that we were created. Now, how are we going to get into that one? I don't know. But, John, for those viewers who we have lots of new viewers all the mm -hmm. time joining Revelation TV, so would you just give us a little bit of your background and sure. just bring us up to date for those who actually know you very well? Okay. Um, grew up in a non-Christian family, non-church going. Um, fell in love with the theory of evolution with my year eight teacher who convinced me I was an animal and that suited me down to the ground because I figured I could do anything I liked despite the pro-Christian morality back in my day at school. Um, fell in love with the theory of evolution, was a good science student and basically was reading a book by an atheist uh, on how there is no God, but it was in my science book. And the reality was I thought this is a stupid argument. Now, looking back, I can say God used it to convict me because the same author poked fun at the Bible. So I picked up the Bible to see what it said. From an atheist point of view, fatal, right? But I, I got to know Jesus Christ through its pages and, hey, I'd better go to church. I'd better get baptized. So there's a short version of, of several years of, of, of coming to Christ. Then, obviously, with a background in geology, used to teach geology, lecture geology, taught science before that, um, people would ask me questions like, what about the dinosaurs? What about Noah's flood? You're Mr. Geologist, you're Mr. Christian. And I didn't know the answers, Howard. So I said, Lord, you'd better show me because these young people are being hindered from trusting Jesus because they don't think the first pages of the Bible are true. And so over the next few years, God really revealed to me through the rocks and the fossils and through study that his word was true from the beginning. Enter creation, uh, enter John Mackay and Ken Ham, enter creation science in Australia, and now we're 40 years down the track and we run the same thing here in England too. All right, now the name of your ministry is Creation Research. So creation anybody research. looking for that, they yes. go to creationresearch.net. Yes, they will have it up on the screen and uh, that people can keep in touch with us through their regular newsletters and free, which is a great price for you your, your watchers and uh, we do ministry all around the planet uh, schools colleges churches field trips people love the field trips because it's one thing to think about fossils and rocks and dinosaurs it's another thing to go with the creation guy John Mackay and dig some up and we do this here in England too yeah now you, you mentioned the fact that you came to the Lord or came mm -hmm. to an understanding a uh, uh, biblical truth mm -hmm. uh, how old were you um, I'm right at the end of high school just deciding what I'm going to do at university and, and things like that. So it definitely was, I've got to say, a real revelation because I started with a science book by an atheist that led me to the Bible, that led me to John 14 as I read. You see, I didn't know the Bible started in the New Testament like most Christians think. It actually starts in Genesis. And by the time I get to John 14, where it says, if you love me and obey my commandments, I will, present tense continuing, make myself known to you. So if people wonder why John Mackay is still so enthusiastic enthusiastic many years later it's because Jesus is actually real and he made me a, a different person and I became aware of his power in creation in me and ultimately in the in the environment as well so right. that's that, that's the background I'm glad you shared that because the reason I asked the question was I was hoping that would be the answer mm. okay because many of our youth today fall away having been brought up in a church environment and, and mm. committed themselves as it were to the lord and then get to university and that's it it seems like uh, they lose their faith well basically what what happens is they're lied to by very authoritative professors like i've got a debate here in england this trip against a professor who wants to say well god used millions of years of evolution and I love to remind such people, hey, wow, the God I know actually turned water into wine just like that. 
and he didn't need millions of years, and he certainly didn't need to mess around with the monkeys trying to turn him into Howard Conder or John Mackay, right? So they've been lied to, deceived by the authority of man. So the choice is, do you trust the God who was there, who can change you, present tense, fix up a drug addict because he can make the universe so quickly? Uh, or do you trust men who never get anything done really quickly anyway? Mm, good point. Uh, now, we, hopefully today we're going to also uh, learn a lot more that will help uh, many of our young folk as well, as, mm -hmm. as well as people who are just coming to a knowledge yes. of Scripture and are interested in Christian or biblical things. Uh, so do stay tuned. We're going to look at uh, creation uh, from a biblical perspective, but having uh, your background does help because it gives more authority and is more credulity in, in it having you here than just someone like myself who just found out these things. It's certainly true when you take people out into the field. Like I still remember one of the professionals who came with me on a field trip. This is down under in Australia. And we're halfway through the trip. I used to lecture in coal geology. And uh, he was looking at the vertical trees that go through the rocks. Never seen such a thing before. And he had a European background and no need to be critical, but they tend to be more emotional than the Brits, right? And uh, anyway, so he's sitting there again and he's talking to himself. And I went up to him and I said, what's wrong? He said, they have lied to me. They, they lie to me. I've seen the evidence with my own eyes, right? And yet those polystrate trees, those vertical trees, if you find anything about them, they'll say they grew in a swamp, slowly they were buried. The world is too old for the Bible to be true. Ignore Christianity. And he discovered that day, hey, the Bible is true from the beginning, and everybody out there, students included, needs to know the evidence is rock solid. Mm. Uh, for me, when I was 21, I started to read the scriptures, but I started with Genesis. So mm -hmm. although that was a bit tough going, getting through the begets and everything else and all the family trees, uh, and some of the things which I just thought were uh, of no consequence at the time, it nevertheless gave me a grounding in mm -hmm. the creation uh, which is mentioned in Genesis. Uh, a lot of people find it hard to imagine uh, th that we've only been around thousands of years, not millions of years. Anything to help people there to grasp this, uh, this is, I think, an important factor. Okay. When you look at the media, particularly, and you being involved in Christian media, you'll know very well all about sales pitches, all about spin doctors, right, and all about selling a lie as if it's the truth. And again, the scripture warns us the devil has been a liar from the beginning. So what people think of as old uh, is actually not what they thought of as old 100 years ago. Now, let me give an, a, an explanation to this. If you think a million years is a long time because you've been told that, you've never experienced it, you're not even 20. Right? You don't even know what a million pounds feels like, let alone a million years. And so one of the things you learn is when people throw big numbers around, they know the average person won't comprehend it. The politicians, we will spend a hundred million pounds on this budget. Well, that's a couple of pounds each through the whole country. It's, it's nothing really. So therefore, what they're doing is deceiving you with big numbers. Whereas if you live as long as you have, Howard, you can look back and say, I remember 40 <laughs> years say? ago, that was a long time. Yeah. And so when you think of even the history of the British Empire, 1600s to now and gone, the Roman Empire, 400 years and gone. How long will Mr. Trump and America last? These are short times, but in reality, 2,000 years ago is really a long time because you're not going to experience it, I'm not going to experience it. So we've been sold a pup, as they say. It's a lie that sounds good, but it's not based on anything we actually observe. OK, let, let's start with the polystrates, though. Let's yep. just, there'll be somebody listening, I'm sure, that going, what on earth are they talking about? Trees in an mm -hmm. upright position mm -hmm. in a swamp or... You know, just give an example of how polystrate trees have actually happened, especially at Mount St. Helens. Okay. Well, we run creationresearch.net, and people can go there, click on museums, or click on Jurassic Ark, which is the name of our museum, and we've set up a special polystrate tank. Um, I've been digging up vertical trees and rocks for a long time, hence the one I took that professional to in Australia. And one year, I was over here looking for a very important polystrate tree because a professor uh, up in um, Manchester had written a paper on how this was a flood deposit. And you say, 
hey, that's unusual. You don't hear words about flood deposits in geology. No, he wasn't a Noah's flood believer. He just made an argument. Look, if you think this tree that's standing up right through, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet of rock actually stood there to be buried and waited for it to happen slowly, we've got a problem. Trees rot. OK, if it was slow, you should have differential rotting up the trunk. You haven't got it. You've got hundreds and hundreds of layers. And he said, let's study the layers. And look, there are different fossils in this one and this one. He said, this is impossible to have land plants, seashells, land plants, seashells, land ends. He said, this is impossible. So this must have happened somehow as a flood deposit. So it's something instant rather than yes. millions of years. And then a while back, I was reading the old Admiralty type records of sh sh sailors who'd been out at sea and they have to report, by Jove, we ran into a tree in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, and it's floating upright. Now, I grew up being, uh, you know, using boats and fishing and all of that, and I still remember myself for the first time seeing seaweed floating vertically. We normally think of things floating horizontally, but trees float vertically too. So at our Jurassic Ark Museum, and folks can go to our creationresearch.net website and see it, we've set up a big tank in which you fill it up with water and then you take the trees or short trees in our experience they haven't got room for big ones and you put them on the pond first day and then by the end of that afternoon some of them have already started to lean over and sink now they're doing so because plants alive or dead soak up water from the bottom to the top and so the bottom gets waterlogged until finally it stands up vertically and it sinks and within a few days the whole lot will be waterlogged and it'll tip over. So if you want to bury it vertically, you have to bury it quickly while it's still like that. So those polystrate trees, of which there are hundreds of thousands uh, in the real world, even though you won't read much about them in the scientific literature, they are actually evidence that all of those vast quantities of your coal seams particularly got there really quickly in flood-type deposition. And, uh, you know, your coal seams up north in, in, in Durham, Newcastle Way, that's part of a Carboniferous-type series that runs over more than 180 degrees of the Earth's surface, and I've investigated much of it. And there are vertical trees by the gazillion through that bed, so it is a big flood. Oh, don't be surprised. The Bible mentions one oh, called no, Noah's really, Flood. Of yes, that's right. That's why that dinosaur DVD, if you want to hold that up, we've called it Dinosaurs Down Under because it's not just about our dinosaur digs. It's not just about, uh, you know, what we've got in Australia at our Jurassic Ark Museum. It's about that when you dig up dinosaurs, they've been drowned. And it's provable, right? So uh, when you look at the polystrate trees or the dinosaurs, you're looking at flood-based, rapid, uh, not long time to be deposition at all. Yeah. Um, in the museum uh, here in the UK, you've mm -hmm. got uh, a sort of se section where they talk about the dinosaurs yes. and how they were found huddled together in mm -hmm. high places, mm -hmm. all in one spot, as it were. Uh, and why did that happen like that? Well, you'll find the most notable example actually comes from over near Belgium, um, where they found 14 or 15 of them, if I remember correctly originally, all stuffed together, all with their necks connected to their heads, connected to their bodies. They were buried alive before their bodies had decomposed. And when you find dinosaurs, uh, and the folks can see this on the screen, I'm doing it with my, my hand, so you've got the head and the tail like that, a short study of reptiles or mammals or even human beings shows that one of the last things we do when we're drowning is, <gasps> and if you've got a tail, the muscles flex behind you and your tail comes up. But that only lasts for a few minutes and then the flexion relaxes and your body relaxes. So if you get dinosaurs all huddled up and all their tails protruding, etc., they were not only drowned, they were buried real fast. Right. Um, some of the first dinosaurs you found here in England, like the ones down near the Isle of Wight and that, they were also buried with seashells, yet they were land creatures. Yes. Now, in the British Museum, is it? There yeah, British are. Museum. Yep. Yeah. They, their account on the wall, what they've written on a mm -hmm. plaque, is we don't know the reason why this happened, but something mm -hmm. catastrophic happened yes. at yes. a moment in time. Yes. Wow. Flood. Uh, there's no doubt about that, but it took me a long time to discover the reason for the prejudice. I should have caught, caught, caught on to it. My first year at Queensland University, first week, the professor said, we're not going to study any such catastrophic rubbish such as, 
and he listed the flood and creation. And I didn't have a background in churchianity and I thought, wow, red paint, don't touch. Why yeah. aren't I allowed to yeah. find out about this, Oops, right? So in person. the end it's backfired yeah. on the professor. But a little while later I had to do a debate here at the university uh, against the professor of Oxford, uh, geology at Oxford, right? And I thought, he's a smart guy, I'm not all that dumb, I'd better do my homework, right? So I got out the founding father of geology's textbook by Charles Lyell, Principles of Uniformitarianism is what it's all about, right? And in there, in the introduction, in this University of Chicago reprint, you find it says, his aim, my aim, is to remove Moses from science. There's the clue. So it's not a fight about how many fossils you find, whether they're drowned or not, but you want to get rid of creation, you want to get rid of Noah's flood, and geology, historical geology, is the biggest spun story on the planet. Uh, it's not dealing with evidence, it's dealing with the lie that Charles Lyell and all of those who follow him have actually sold big time to the public, and you and I need to expose it. All right, so you could have a plaque that just says, we don't do God. Yeah, that's, that's much better, much, yeah. much more honest. Okay. Uh, well, that's a very prejudiced mm -hmm. position, and I suppose people like you and I uh, could be said to be prejudiced for our position that we have now, but y you had to be convinced. And I, given I, the background that you have and the education and your intellectual... Uh, well, I certainly had to be prowess. convinced because, you know, um, coming from an academic background, coming from um, a non-church background, you couldn't say I was prejudiced for Christianity. Right, exactly. Um, I'd come the other way. Uh, I still had... Probably you'd call it an untrained mind rather than open mind, but I was inquisitive. I always liked to know, hey, if this is a hole, where is the water gone that was in it, right? I like to know that I'm sort of one of those inquis... What's inside the rock? I have that rock? with my pocket. <laughs> and where's my money gone? <laughs> Through the hole, that's yes. right. Uh, and, and in reality, yeah. um, when you are an inquisitive student, uh, you discover one thing about this world. You only get the answers to the questions that you ask. But if you then do education, right, you then discover hey, there's a whole series of questions you're not allowed to ask. Like you just put your head on it, we don't do God. Now, that's now official. It's been around mm -hmm. for 150 years as the hidden policy, but now in the Science Teachers Journal, a few years ago, they said science is any explanation without reference to God, which makes a very important point, particularly for the young people who are listening. If science is any explanation without reference to God, it's therefore atheistic or agnostic. Therefore, it's anti-Christian, anti-Judaic, anti right, it's anti-biblical, and you need to know that. Because this issue, creation, evolution, the age of the earth, is really not science versus religion, it's truth versus error. And the definition of truth is anything except the one who is truth in science. And for a Christian, prejudiced? Well, if you're prejudiced for the truth, it's because he who is the truth knows more about it than you do. So you, there's always that prejudice, but you have to choose which one. Mm. And usually I would say people that I've known over the years, uh, those that have a, a biblical perspective and point of view, don't arrive there uh, like, you know, just it evolved in their family or anything else. They've usually had to sit down and say, do you know what, and make a, um, a, an intellectual decision, as well as an emotional one perhaps, that they believe what the Bible says. You, you actually do, and it shouldn't surprise us because Jesus said you love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul and your brains, right? So Christianity is not true because you believe it. You believe it because it happens to be true. There you go. And the yes. God of the Bible says, come, let's reason together. Yes. Now, you can only reason with your mind. If you reason with your heart, you're in trouble, right? So you reason with your mind and God expects you to, to do that. And that's why Romans 1.20 says the evidence is so clear and God has made it so, so that everyone has no excuse. Right, so over the years as I've debated, and there's quite a lot of free debates on our, our creationresearch.net YouTube, and uh, you will find that the, the evolutionist is the one who's actually shutting his mind down, first by definition, I will not go anywhere where God is. Now in doing that, you block yourself off from so much evidence that's actually there. And the Christian has to say, well, I'm willing to be that open. I'm willing to actually include, hey, God turned water into wine when it was on planet Earth. That means he invented carbon. That means he doesn't need time to make organic molecules because look at the size of some of the red molecules in, in wine, right? So therefore you'll find that this Jesus, if you're open to him, 
hey, now I know why Michael Faraday got so far in science, because he started with the one who was truth. Exactly, right? And yes. so people who say religion mm. and science have nothing to do with each other don't know what they're talking about. Well, let's, let's take somebody like Sir Isaac Newton, then. Mm -hmm. you know, he's a, a definite believer, a great scientist, great, great uh, mind, uh, comes to a, a conclusion in the end that there is a God and that there, his word, and he writes a lot about it, about mm -hmm. Daniel, the mm -hmm. book of Daniel, that uh, we could actually be facing some great catastrophe in the mid-21st century. Now, he well, wrote that hundreds of years ago. He certainly um, had a, a, a God-based mindset. So when you listen to the story about, you know, sitting under an apple tree while the plague is ru rummaging mm -hmm. through London and being hit on the head by an apple, and ha, ah, the law of gravity, or most of that's just sheer nonsense. Isaac Newton's brilliance is not that he discovered the law of gravity, because as I've said so many times, the first guy who fell down the steps discovered the law of gravity. But what Newton did was say, there is a God of law and order. He knows that because the scripture says, I am a God of law and order, right? And therefore, if God is a God of law and order and he has stamped his nature on creation, which Romans 1.20 says, right? Therefore, whatever keeps the moon up, a big apple in the sky, must be the same thing that brings the little apple down. What's the connection? And so therefore, it's a religious revelation and a, a something coming from outside that enabled Newton to make the next step. So again, people don't dissociate religion and science because what you should be doing is saying, what's the right religion which will give me the right science? So that's the connection. And yes, you will find that anybody who has studied the history of the world, who has studied the scriptures, knows also that Peter and the others talk about in the last days, men will willingly deny creation, the flood, in order to deny the coming judgment mm -hmm. of fire. And yes, that's what the scripture is pointing to. Yeah. Many people would probably say, OK, well, I don't accept uh, the fact that God really created all of this. Um, and I would say to them, and I don't know how you feel about this, but if they believe that Jesus Christ existed and they're saying he is the, our saviour, etc., etc., then surely it would go against the grain to think that he's a liar. Because he says, in the beginning, is it not so? Have you not read it? Mm -hmm. Come on, have you not read it? He made them male and female. He made them. He created them. I like to catch such people out because what we're really talking about is those who would claim to be theistic evolutionists. So yes, Jesus is real. We treat that as history, but Genesis is myth or allegory or whatever. And I like to ask them, okay, are you looking forward to the new heavens and new earth? You know, Revelation yep, 21, 21. 20. Oh yes, no more taxes, no yes. more death, no yes. more, you know, any of those sort of things, right? And so most Christians who would claim to be Bible believers are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth, but they've never thought of two questions. One is, who's going to make the new earth? And of course, the answer is the creator of all. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Question, how many million years are you ready to hang around waiting while he makes the next one? Yes, Because right. that's what you said he took to make the last one, and he said, I made it in six days, and I'll give you a warning. He doesn't need to use six days anymore because the six days had a legal reason. The legal reason was to give us the law. The reason for the law was the people of Israel would govern their lives by six days of labour and one day of rest because Jesus would come and keep the whole law, including the six days of labour, and on the seventh day he rested in the grave and they would know somebody has kept the whole law alive and dead and he doesn't need to take that long anymore. That purpose has been fulfilled. So he's going to make the next heaven in six seconds or less, right? He didn't need time in the beginning. He had a moral and legal purpose. Okay, so where do we go from here? What sort of questions do you get, John, on a fairly regular basis? Well, the ones that have really, really come up, I, I've been doing a lot of schools lately. I had a couple of hundred students in a race course venue. It was unbelievable. And, of course, they were free to ask anything. And uh, I had to be surprised that... Uh, well, not surprised, that probably a third of them were about the gay issue, the lesbian issue, the transgender issue, right? And to start from the last one, I had to inform some of them, look, when you are born, you have X or Y chromosomes. If you have two Xs, you're a girl. If you have an X and a Y, you're a male. If you have two Xs and a Y, you're in serious trouble and you're usually degendered, right? Uh, you can't have two Ys. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's a way it goes on. In other words, I could say, listen, if you claim to be a girl and you were born a boy, I can prove right away 
that you are still exactly what you were born. Uh, one of our workers, Dr. Diane Eager, has done a wonderful paper on our ask site, our question site, and she was a medical biologist on is there any such thing as transgender? Can you choose sex? You know how they're wanting to be able to choose which toilet mm -hmm. they go into every next week? All this is ridiculous, but it's an example of demons lying to people about who they ought to be, because their real joy will only come when they're remade in God's image, not remade in their own likeness, right? They need to be remade in His. And so it, what's popular out there amongst the students is what's happening in the media. But connecting all the dots here, I think 35 years ago, I gave a message in a church which I thought had been lost and forgotten. Somebody turned up with an old, remember the old cassettes? Mm -hmm. Word that doesn't make sense to many young people out there. The audio cassettes. Yeah, the old yeah. audio cassettes, that's right. And, and on it was that message. And I thought, isn't it fascinating? Because there we are looking at Matthew 19, and God made them male and female, therefore a man will take a wife. And I actually, courtesy the Holy Spirit, said, listen, if we don't get straight with this, you watch, homosexuality will increase and increase and increase and the churches need to get this sorted out. This is God's word and it's true about male and female in the beginning. Therefore, we will only have real joy when we're married the way he wants us to be. Yeah. It seems uh, in some respects when people uh, say that they're in this time of flux in their mm -hmm. lives where they don't know who they are, what they are, is this a modern phenomenon or is it something that goes back thousands of years? Uh, you will find there's always been some people who've been confused about who they were, um, particularly when you come from an unstable family. Now, often it has never showed us confusion of gender, right? It showed us confusion of role in terms of should I be a dominant husband or a dominant wife? It showed in all those sorts of things. But as far as I know, uh, this is one of the first times you've had what you'd call mass confusion of gender, um, particularly when politicians are trying to pass legislation that kids can be whatever they want, think they can be without their parents' approval. We've never seen that in any country, to my knowledge. Right. In Scripture, though, there are, from memory, um, passages that say that we are to be what we are and to dress accordingly. You know, if we're uh, male, we're supposed to look like men. Yes. Um, we're not to wear long hair. Yes. Uh, we're uh, not to look as if we're a f mm -hmm. f feminine. Um, and the same applies to the females, not yes. to look masculine, mm -hmm. you know, go, go out of their way. Um, because it's something that God finds distasteful, to put it It nicely. certainly is. Uh, I mean, I had one student recently said, oh, my friend, he's gay, and he spoke to his pastor at his church, and the pastor said, oh, you're not in any trouble with God. He'll accept you into heaven. And I said, well, listen, I have to be honest with you. I said, you've got a choice to make. You can either believe the pastor who will not be sending this guy to heaven or hell, who says it's okay to be gay, or you can believe God who says there are no homosexuals in the kingdom of God. I said, now or forever, amen. Your choice, son. You'll have to make that choice. And you'll find that this all the ways goes back. You can trace it historically. Jesus quoted Genesis. Genesis actually becomes the basis of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, about our dressing. In other words, God always wants us to be recognisably male and female. In the Garden of Eden, it wouldn't have been a problem, Howard. No, because we're no, all both, right. It naked. was easy to tell which one was the woman. Yeah. And, and for, even if we never got clothes, that would have been a distinction that God insisted. It's pleasing to him. Why? Because when he created everything, he said, this is what's good. I made them male, I made them female. That's God's definition of good. That's what you need to stand by. That's what I need to stand by, no matter how popular or unpopular we are out there. And as you know and I know, I love to put tempters out to people saying, do you love sinners enough to warn them? Whether they're, I mean, you know the mm. warning in Corinthians where Paul says, no homosexuals, no greedy, no lustful, One no avaricious. Six, That's right. And, and it, he, he adds all sorts of things there. He's not just picking on one group. Mm. There's liars, thieves. That's right, adulterers. Right, adulterers, yeah. idolaters, right? Yeah. And you and I need to love them enough to say, listen, mm. you know, we, we're sorry for what you're at, but you, you need to be warned there's a God who does have the right to judge even if I don't. Yeah, and even if we like it or not. Yeah. And that applies to us yeah. no matter what we are. Yeah, that's uh, right. You know, and how, uh, however we are living mm. is what we have to... Mm. Uh, 
come before the Lord with. Yeah, you we know? do. And we do. If, we, if we can make those changes, which uh, we're invited to do so, because yeah. it does say in the yeah. other scriptures following uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, yeah. that's what some of you were. And Paul says, by the grace of God, yeah. we've changed. That's true. In fact, I was really thrilled just recently. Um, we, d we do a DVD called, Are You Born Homosexual? Uh, when I did geology, you know, we geologists dig up dead things. So I went and did deliberately did three years of genetics, uh, particularly because in my family there's a problem that's associated with male sex. And it's a, a problem I was born with associated with my stomach. My stomach wouldn't open right. It's largely associated with boys. And I wanted to discover what p probability uh, my wife and I would have of having a, a child like that. And I discovered the odds were one in 27, so I, I figured we'd better stop at 26 kids. Um, but that's not how it works. But in doing so, I deliberately studied the genetics of sex. Now, from then till now, there's not the slightest evidence you're ever born homosexual. So we put this out on DVD, and I was really thrilled to actually get a reply from two young men who said, we didn't even know it was wrong. We've been living as homosexuals. We're going to stop right now. Right? And I thought, wow, there's the first step of repentance. Now you've got to come all the way through to Christ. Mm -hmm. And just um, on a recent trip to New Zealand, our um, rep there read out a, a, a little paper we did on gay, right? And unknown to him, there were two young men in the church who were in a gay relationship. And he said they stormed out of the church. But he said a month later they were back and they'd given up their gaydom. Right? Yeah, there's a yes. new word for you, gay yeah. instead yeah. of kingdom. So it is a joy to confront people as politically mm. incorrect as it might be. If you love people, that's what Jesus did when he came down. He was politically correct about everything, uh, incorrect, but he told us the truth. Yeah, thank God. Okay, um, just to say that we're not doing uh, live emails uh, and uh, anything that to do with uh, questions coming in live, we can't do that today. Uh, but, John, um, other points that you want to share with us? G give us a little bit of a rundown on your two new um, sets of DVDs. Uh, okay, the uh, DVDs. DVD one we've done before on dinosaurs, so just a brief mention of, again, yeah. it's part of a three-part series. And uh, just like most uh, Christian organisations, you can now get it as hard copy or you can download the MP4s and save a fortune there. But it's all about the evidence dinosaurs existed, God created them, and the flood is a real fact of history. And here's how it shows in dinosaurs. Kids love it. I mean, we all love monsters, right? And the kids love the big monsters too. So that's about dinosaurs. And the other one, the uh, monkeys, uh, don't cry. You can hold that one up too. Yep. Um, it's a fun one. Uh, it's really all about how we are so different from apes and monkeys and gorillas. Howard, look me in the eye. Um, do you realise you can see the whites of my eyes? Just about. Yes, but you <laughs> can't do that for monkeys or apes or gorillas because they don't have them. Really? Yes, but yet you won't find that in the textbooks, right? So as we What's put that, a, then? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not got any whites to its eyes, right? So what you find is that they're dull brown all the there way through, go. right? Yeah. And so what you find is when you look at the differences not just the similarities, there are so many differences between apes and monkeys and gorillas and all of us, you have to go to university for years to be trained not to see them. And that's what that DVD is all about. A lot of fun, a lot of facts, a lot of help for people who think, hey, if we're so like apes and monkeys and gorillas, um, how could we ever believe in creation? And yet we're so different, there's not one chimpanzee watching this program, is there? I doubt it. And no baboons are emailing us with questions. Sometimes grandchildren can be little yeah, monkeys. That's right? <laughs> yeah, so they wouldn't be watching anyway, this that, program. Anyway, that's the two new DVDs, Why Monkeys Don't Cry and uh, Dinosaurs Down Under. Right. Um, just maybe a couple of pointers on the monkey business mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, th that's something that comes out regularly. You know, where these yes. are our next, uh, you know, our predecessors. You know, wh what is it? People might say, well, we're what 93 percent like the apes yep that is the in common the figure that's touted yep. around there and uh, we deal with that on that dvd series as well as on our ask uh, if you go to creation research tonight click the q a button ask there's a lot of questions on apes and gorillas and monkeys etc because they're very common out there but what you find is uh the differences um are so important that that figure of 93 percent is actually a misrepresentation. All right, now you've got elections in this country and don't we normally have a concept that in a democracy, 51% is important? 
Right. Uh, well, us. I thought so before Brexit. I know. I thought these. <laughs> yeah, but in reality, that's the way most people think. So when I say 98% is the same, wow! The closer we are related, the more percentage will be the same. Now that's how voting works. That's how democracies work. It's not how genetic codes work at all. So that when you have a look at the genetic code, you will discover because of the many ways it can be read, you can have 98% of the letters the same, but 100% of the meaning is different. And the simple analogy we use for coding in there, before we give you some sophisticated ones, is even in English we can see this. God is now here. Four letters. You believe that? I believe that. I'm a Christian. I know Jesus is within me, right? Is what, you know, what the scripture says, that's the guarantee of our inheritance. So anybody is watching out there, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior within you, you need to do business. Talk to Howard, talk to me, talk to Jesus, right? And basically God is now here is a Christian testimony. But I can keep the same letters, the same orders, and write God is nowhere. Right. Now that's 100% so, different without changing any of the letters at all. So the DNA. And if we're smart enough to do that, you think of what God can do with whole sentences. So therefore, it's a lie. That's why, as I keep telling people, that they're in the zoo and we're running the zoo. That's how important the difference are. We're writing books and they're not even reading them. There's no First Baptist Monkey Church in town, right? They don't even have organised religion. We do, whether we're atheists or not. For some of us, football is our religion. Right? We are there every Sunday. Mm. But The Planet of the Apes, have you seen any of those movies? Oh, yes, yes. I, I, I've I mean, got to admit, I enjoy e e escapade, um, yeah. science fiction, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you were there and you had, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes, standard cowboy line, yeah. wouldn't work for The Planet of the Apes because you can't see the whites of their eyes. Okay. Uh, other things that you want to share, but, or maybe even going back, over the years that you've been in ministry, I, I mean, you just spent uh, how many trips have you done, for example, from Australia to oh, part sometimes of the world? several several a year to the point where the customs agents get to know you <laughs> quite well, um, and, and yet yeah, ministries like that. Uh, when the Lord calls you, I mean, I got called to England, I've no shadow of a doubt. I was reading a, a, a book by uh, a, a um, evangelist from the last century talking about his call to England. I just felt that burden. So every year I'm here once or twice and uh, it, it's been a long time watching and researching here. This is a country that used to export missionaries. Now you need to import them Absolutely. to tell the truth. Big right? time. Yes. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is the old interest you had over here in those, in, you know, the petrification caves where you could put your bonnet under a, a limestone drip and it would turn to rock. Uh, well, we've actually started to duplicate that at our Jurassic Ark Museum down under, and I'll be presenting some papers on this trip showing you exactly how fast those things happen. When I was a kid, my dad had a um, galvanised iron tank. I'm not sure if they're even familiar with those things over here, but Australia, yep. no town I water. I think the, old, the older ones the probably, older ones probably those, would. Yeah. And they would wear out after a while, and you get little cracks appearing, and the water would start to drip out. Not a good plan in Australia. So you cement the inside. Okay, now I'm only young at the time, six or seven, and then you would notice the water would start to seep out even through the cement, and running down the outside would be a white strip, and then as you watched, a little stalactite would grow. So as a kid, I knew, hey, stalactites grow real quick. Then I graduate in geology at Queensland University. I visit caves, and they say, don't touch the stalactites. They take so long to grow, right? And I thought, Hang on, when I was a kid, they grew real fast. How come they take so long to grow now? So what we've done is set up a, the world's, world's first stalactite machine just to show that it's the rubbish in the cave, the, the leaf matter on the roof of the cave and on the top of the rocks that's providing the bacteria, not the chemistry. Right, the chemistry, if you try to dissolve lime in water, even if you throw in a bit of CO2, that's quite slow. Throw in some bugs, which you've got DNA in them, and you find the stalactites will grow actually quite fast. So we've got a stalactite <coughs> machine in which the stalactites are now this long, and October 2017, that is two years old, yeah. right? Growing roughly one centimetre a month, so you don't need millions of years, you don't need thousands, real quick. So that's the sort of stuff we're doing to help students see, hey, it's not time, it's process. So if your name is Jesus, you've got the right process. 
It's interesting because down under here mm -hmm. below us is the car park, mm -hmm. and in there there's some evidence that you're talking about. You, know, you mean the stalactites have yeah. started growing? That's yeah. right. Yeah, and it's only because there seems to be water seeping from the surface here, the the ground surface, to the lower surface, and uh, and I'm wondering how 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 quick they grow. They do grow quickly yeah. because the uh, you know you've got all the dust and the muck coming in on the cars and the leaves that blow through. And that's what's actually providing the bacteria, which makes it happen even quicker. So uh, y you're quite observant how... I first saw this, I had a lecture to give at Reading University, and there was a car park there that was only sort of six years of age, and the stalactites were like this. It was an open structure car park, and I thought, that is not what they're teaching the kids at schools. And because the kids are so brainwashed, they don't even see that. They know it's there, but it doesn't even... Re the school is different. Scientists know what they're talking about. I did a debate here last year against one of the professors from a university over in East Anglia, and uh, he said, but the world is so old, evolution must be true. But when he's asked for evidence of evolution, he didn't have the slightest, right? Didn't have the slightest evidence for evolution, despite his speciality. And I thought, you know, you are brainwashed even you as a professor, into thinking these things take such a long time to happen and that's how effective the Devil's Spin program is. Now, you've had the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, Richard Dawkins, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, yes. On, uh, yes. I remember there was a video I saw where he sort of gate-crashed you with the BBC Yeah, crew. for BBC Four. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Richard is a guy who needs to know Christ. Uh, he's gotten very sick over the past few years with a stroke, etc. Um, hasn't seen much of him in public, to my knowledge, here um, since then. But uh, basically an atheist. He wrote several books. I'm, I'm on quite a few pages because he doesn't like people like me who basically say, listen, no wonder you guys take so long to make the universe. Put somebody smart in charge, you get done a whole lot quicker. And he doesn't want the somebody smart. He even hates the intelligent designers, right? And he even... Uh, he is, is quite intellectually consistent because he's one of the few atheists who will actually have a shot at the theistic evolutionists and accuse the bishops and that of being utter hypocrites. Yes, right? that was and quite an interesting quite line. And he's quite actually right yeah. uh, in, in doing that. Um, most of the Christians are too pussyfooted when it comes to the bishops who won't take a stand on the scriptures. So what you'll find is um, he's very atheistic and so antagonistic in his atheism, he even upsets many of the people who should be on his side, right? <laughs> so he's quite an antagonistic personality. But if you watch that clip, uh, which you can find Mackay versus Dawkins, you will see that he didn't fare all that well because truth always mm. wins against skillful lies. Mm. And I love to tell people, listen, when the scripture says God will give you the words, this wasn't a prepared interview. This is one where he just turned up That's and wanted right. to denominate it and turned it into a mini debate in front of a live audience. It went really well. But what you find is the Lord promises to put words in our mouth if we ask him and we, quick Lord, I need some wisdom. And he is the God who works that quickly. And what you find is the truth always wins against Satan's spin. Mm. Now, as uh, a creationist, uh, that. I find that a lot of creationists don't want to talk about end times um, and the coming of the return of the Lord and all that he's promised, you know, the new heavens and mm -hmm, new earth. Mm -hmm. So you, you appear to be a little uh, more uh, open to that. Well, I guess that's simply because I come from outside the church and I'd finished the whole Bible before I went to church. Right, and I'd reached a conclusion that I... Sorry I'm... to laugh, but yeah, that's a great idea, that's great. Don't go to church thinking you're going to understand the Bible. I, I didn't say that yeah. was the no, conclusion. No, but I am. Yeah, um, so I, 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 I read the whole Bible. Now, you've got to remember, in my day, we still had religious education once a week in school. Yeah. So I, did, I, it, what, I didn't come from ground zero. Uh, I did have a bit of a, a, a knowledge, but basically it was all the... Uh, and King David killed the giant, all the story bits. You didn't get any teaching. They weren't allowed to teach doctrine. But uh, anyway, uh, so what I noticed was when you start in Genesis, God has Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sin, and then the rest of the Bible is God working out his plans to save his people from the consequences of sin. And in doing so, you find Abraham, 
or Abram as he shows up in Genesis 12, and you have no idea how Abram actually becomes a believer because his dad's a pagan. I know, he, you know he, and his he, family. He have no Sabbath knowledge, yeah, no yeah. nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you find is God chooses Abram then to, to encourage him, change his name to Abraham because he's already promised him a descendant who will have the whole land of, land of Canaan. That's a sort of a land rights promise that still causes controversy today. Doesn't it? And so ultimately you end up with Israel, Right, and then you find God working his plan through Israel, then you have the division of Israel, and you have Judah, and finally you have Jesus coming to his own. Right? And he did that deliberately because he's already promised that through Abraham the whole world will be blessed. Right? So Abraham, Israel, Judah, Jesus, hey, you preach to the Jews, now go into the whole world and preach the gospel. But as Paul, who's a converted Jew, and most people forget that, right? Paul writes, I would that all Israel be saved, but there's going to come a time when they will be. Right now, I have many friends of sort of this persuasion, so I know all that's symbolic. I say, oh, hang on, no, it's not, because it doesn't make the slightest sense. If you read Paul writing that symbolically, it just doesn't mean anything. Talking it's about like Romans 10 and 11. Yeah, that's exactly right. When, when, when you read Genesis and people say it's symbolic, you say, hang on, if it's symbolic, symbolic of what? And there's no answer to that. Likewise, when you get to Paul's comments on the future of Israel, if it's symbolic, symbolic of what? It doesn't make it, there's no sense left to it. It's not that you change the meaning, you just remove all meaning. So therefore, there is a future role for Israel as part of God's plan, and Christians need to acknowledge that. And I said to one guy the other day, um, what you find is that people who deny the historicity of Genesis 1 to 12 which is very common out there in the Christian churches, actually deny the historicity future tense of From Revelation 12 21. On. Yeah, well, particularly of Revelation. Yeah. They deny the beginning, they usually deny the end. That's an interesting point. I'd never really sort of put mm. those two together, but it well, is first true, earth, isn't it? Next earth. Yeah, right. What on earth first sin, <laughs> no sin. Yeah. First death, no more death. Yeah. First taxes, hey, freedom. Yeah. yeah. How are they going to fare, the church that. Uh, that way inclined? Um, I think you'd have to say overall most churches today are not faring well, particularly those who've gone what I call the happy clappy let's have no doctrine route, right? Now by doctrine that's our old word for teaching, right? And Jesus said go into all the world teaching them what I have commanded you to. And Jesus taught about Adam and Eve, he taught about marriage, he taught about divorce, he taught about Noah, he taught about end times, right? So if we're going to be faithful, no matter how popular we are in the church, and remember people like Luther and Martin uh, and Calvin were not popular in the church, right? The official church of the day. And you and I have to be bold enough to say, this is what God's word says, right? But we have to go from Genesis to Revelation and not, not back off from it. So yes, I guess you can say in one, reason, one sense I'd be unusual because most people or many ministries today like to be single topic and yet the scripture tells all of us preach the whole counsel of God. Mm -hmm. So hence John Mackay can be unpopular even though he's the creation guy because he has an attitude about this or an attitude about homosexuality or an attitude about marriage and divorce or Israel. Right, but that's where God has called you to teach the whole counsel of God, and you need to do it too. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. Well, you know, I, I find that very refreshing because I know some uh, ministries uh, like who are into mm -hmm. a similar uh, stance as you that we are created and we haven't evolved, but they don't have the uh, revelation of Israel or of the coming of the Lord again, mm. and they seem to just stick by what they. Uh, have found themselves ministering on, and that is to, to sort of combat the lies that you were saying earlier, uh, that people have been deceived, especially this generation, because you get to university, it seems like uh, they've got all, all the children that have mm. come through a church life, mm. and suddenly they fall apart. Do you think that's be probably because they haven't been taught the whole gospel? Um, there's, there's yes and there's no to that. Because if you look at the historicity of scripture, first of all, it doesn't start with creation. It starts with creator. So the basic issue is accepting the creator or not. The creation is the next step. Then the next step is the fall into sin. And all heresies start there. So what you find is the real problem is not evolution versus creation, 
but sin versus righteousness, right? And so if you had the whole gospel preached, you need to do Genesis 1, Genesis 2, then Genesis 3, and it's much later that you see the theory of evolution. Now, in reality, the scripture doesn't stop at the, at the creation story. It continues on to the book of Revelation. So you'll find that if you want to deal with the young people who've actually dropped out of church, then the real problem is sin. That evolution is their excuse. Now, 50 years ago, sin was still the problem, but it was more, you know, relativism. Right? And that's gone and it's been replaced by a logical justification of it. Now, in 50 years' time, when we beat up the Dawkinses and done in the Attenboroughs and, and in Brian Cox, I've got to do a lot on Brian Cox on this trip, it should be interesting. But in reality, you'll find there'll still be the problem of sin. And the only solution is Jesus, the Saviour, who is also the Creator, right? And the rest of the doctrines, hey, you and I have to teach them all the counsel of God, not just the bits that are convenient to us because I've got a university ministry. Right? Mm -hmm. We have to teach the lot. Very good. Uh, you're going to probably just diverse a little bit here into the modern day. Um, how, how do you feel, uh, given the, the ministry that you have, uh, about the Donald Trumps and uh, the Rocket Man? <laughs> <laughs> well. You probably could have asked the same question about uh, Churchill and Hitler yeah. um, back in World War II, right? You had two mm. very strong personalities. Um, you still do today. Now, I'll be blunt with you. I like many of the things Donald Trump says. I appreciate that he's inexperienced as a politician. Perhaps he will learn to uh, be the a more better politician, bit. right, rather than a bull at the gate. Um, but you would love a person like that in this country who could say, OK, gay military's out and do so with, you know, grand decorum and one, one, one rule. Um, now, at the same time, you will find that also can cause problems with an equally strong personality uh, who thinks of himself as God. And you've got to realise that Trump is pro-God and pro-Christian. I'm not sure what his own personal stand is there, but you know from his doctrine that he's pro-God and pro-Christian. Whereas when you look at our friend uh, in Korea, that, the town he's in used to be the leading Christian town in the whole of that northeast section of Asia, right? And he went to church as a kid, right? And when he went to church, his mother would always close her eyes and she, she would appear reverent to him. And one day he noticed she seemed to be asleep. And then he asked, you know, why do we come to church? And she said, because it's so quiet, I get the only rest each week. <laughs> now that's when he turned his back wow. on God and he decided... I'm going to be the way, I'm going to be the truth, and, I'm going, and that's what he calls himself, yeah. right? So he is, in his own eyes, Messiah equals human God. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, but do you, think, do you think it's actually going to uh, come down to the fact that they, somebody's going to pull the trigger? Well, probably somebody will pull the trigger in the long run anyway. Because of Scripture. Because of Scripture, because there's going to be that conflagration, there's going to be the Antichrist, there's going to be all of those things. Mm. Whether it's this generation or not, remember when it used to be Khrushchev? And then it was the Ayatollah. And so you and I need to learn from history that our predictions are very limited. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it'd be nice to get it over with, wouldn't it? But I'd rather yeah. not be here. <laughs> you know, so what you find is caution is necessary. And the one thing that Christians should do out there is do you pray for Kim Il-sung? Mm. Right? Because we are Good called point. to. That man might get saved. Yeah, I mean, gosh. Paul went Never around killing Christians. Yeah. Um, Donald Trump, you better pray for him too. Yes. Right, even in, like, we've got some people in our church who support Myanmar and all the, the problems over there. As I put on their website, you need to pray for the Burmese army, right? Not just for them to be beat up. They need Christ. They need to. Uh, and so yes. the refugees, yeah. and they need to know Christ as the creator, not their Buddhistic sort of a mm. agnostic atheism. Yeah. Yes, to love our enemies. Yeah. Uh, to pray for them. That's right. That's what Jesus said yeah, in the Beatitudes. Yeah. John, we're coming to the end of this program. Uh, God willing, will uh, many others to follow. Amen. Uh, if you can keep going backwards and forwards, yes, it must be right. 40, 50, 60 times that you've actually travelled from Australia yes, over quite the years. A lot. I do appreciate you, brother, mm -hmm. and I'm sure our audience do too. I just want to say, uh, please do support this ministry. It's a really worthwhile ministry. Uh, creationresearch.net. Uh, uh, go on the website, and I'm sure you can make your donations there because John has faithfully served the Lord 
uh, for many, many more years than me. And uh, I know and we you do know. have a, a trust here in the UK. They can As do well. that through too. Good. Yeah. John, uh, yes, I want to say welcome back to the UK. Hope you have a great uh, time of ministry here. Thank you so much indeed, John. God bless you too at home. Thank you for joining us on The Late Show. And um, we'll see you next time uh, when we have uh, a revelation to share with you. Good night. <laughs>